Standing up. Standing up. Standing up. Standing up for the world. Standing up for the world. Standing up. Standing up for the world. But we're sitting down for these interviews, right? Okay. These are stories about life, about Oxford, about the Rhodes Scholarship. Prologue. Um, it really is an honor to be here. I've had the opportunity to speak more than a few times in this room, things that I never thought I would do when I came up to Oxford in, 19, in the Michaelmas term of 1979. I think we were the third class of Rhodes women. I was also um, with just a handful of other Rhodes Scholar women that year. We were the first group of women to ever attend Maudlin since 1548. <laughs> Yeah, this was that kind of place. <laughs> this is Karen Stevenson, opening the 40 Years of Rhodes Women anniversary at Rhodes House in September. So, I want to talk about some rules of engagement for the weekend as we go forward. First off, let's, can we agree that there is no perfect woman? First rule of engagement, all right? Everybody's journey is worthy of respect. Some people took the long way home. Some people look like they've had it easy. You don't know until you actually engage with that person, engage with that woman about what her journey has actually been. Can we agree that our bodies are our own? Can we agree to stop letting other people tell us how to be women? Whatever our size and shape, and trust me, time and gravity are undefeated <laughs> in terms of our forms. If we have kids, great. If we want kids, great. If we don't want kids, can we support her too? Is that okay? If we take time off from an apparently impressive, prestigious career to raise the kids we do have, can we agree that she did not fail? A lot of people don't know that Sandra Day O'Connor took eight years off to raise her kids. She still made it to the Supreme Court. No one holds that against her. Let's not hold that against one another. And if we decide to go balls to the wall in our career and we don't want to marry and we don't want to have kids, can we agree that that's all right too? Can we agree to stop cursing one another for our choices? How can we stand up for the world if we don't stand up for one another? So this weekend, I hope you will find time to reconnect, to reminisce with friends, and maybe connect with some not so like-minded friends. <laughs> Let us listen deeply to one another, respectfully to one another. We have this precious time of these few days when this gathering of women from all parts of the globe, from all professions and all walks of life and all backgrounds to have a conversation. So that was how we started. The first women Rhodes Scholars arrived in Oxford in 1977. In September 2017, we celebrated 40 years of Rhodes women in Oxford. 40 years. That seems like a long time to me, but it also seems like not long enough. But I have to tell you, it was good to hear those ground rules. Rules of engagement, as Karen put it. I'm not even sure I realized how much I needed to hear someone say those things out loud. It turned out that a lot of the weekend was like that for me. Okay, so wait, who am I? You're probably wondering at this point. I'm Kira Allman, Virginia and Maudlin 2010. I did my DPhil at Oxford in Middle Eastern Studies, and I also attended the 40 Years of Rhodes Women Weekend, which we're going to talk a lot more about in this episode. This is a new podcast series from the Rhodes House. I'm interviewing Rhodes scholars, past and present, about their experiences in Oxford and beyond. The scholarship has this big reputation. But the thing about notoriety like that is that you often lose the specificity, the reality, the lived experiences of individuals who make this award their own. There is no one kind of Rhodes Scholar. There is no universal Rhodes story. This is a scholarship that's distinguished, challenging, controversial, contradictory, changing. 
It's old, but the Rhodes Scholarship of today looks very different from the scholarship of the past. It's diverse, but probably not diverse enough. It's forward-looking, but it has to reconcile with its history. So in this series, we just want to hear from members of the Rhodes community, talking about their journeys in their own words. And we're starting with a recap of the 40th anniversary of Rhodes Women Scholars. Chapter 1. How did we get here? If there's one question that's pretty likely to underpin any anniversary celebration, it's this one. How did we get here? That's what we're celebrating after all, right? Getting here? Sure, it's a question we might ask of the whole event, the whole anniversary. It's a question we ask our institutions, our societies. How did we as women assert our belonging in these spaces? But it's also a question we each ask ourselves, in private moments, on a personal level. It can definitely feel celebratory, but it can also be mixed in with a lot of other feelings. Self-doubt, denial, skepticism, anxiety. How did I get here? What am I doing here? And maybe due to the way the scholarship started, the way Oxford started really, by men, for men, these are questions that loom larger for women. Or maybe they're just questions for everybody that need the right venue to be asked and answered. I was surprised to find how often the anniversary weekend became that kind of venue. I think we all arrived expecting something from the event and came away with experiences we didn't know we needed. Here's Jennifer Haverkamp, Ohio and Somerville, 1979. I think that my original thought was that it was going to be more like a conventional reunion and it would be really fun to catch up with the women that I knew when I was here. And so when I saw that there weren't that many people from my cohort coming, I sort of thought, well, at least I'll get to see Oxford. (laughs) (laughs) And I've been blown away, just so charged and energized and excited by the group who's here, the uh, different things people are doing, the desire to share and learn from each other, and the just welcome collegial sororial spirit that I'm feeling is uh, way beyond what I thought I might find. It's worth saying at this point that you'll hear a few different voices in this episode, but it is only a few voices. There were 70 speakers and over 150 attendees at the 40th anniversary, and I managed to accost just a handful of them for interviews on the spot. But their insights echo themes we heard throughout the weekend, and you'll get to hear more from these and other voices in future episodes. One of the things I really appreciated about the anniversary weekend was getting to hear about how other women scholars felt when they first got the roads or first arrived in Oxford. I wanted to know how it felt to get here. And here's a little of what I heard. Okay, we're all set here. So uh, would you both like to introduce yourselves? I'm Denise Thal, and I'm identified as Michigan Jesus 1977. Hi, and I'm Rupa Unikrishnan, and I'm from uh, India, Balil, 1995. Do you remember coming up to Oxford? What was that like? Uh, do you think that it's different now? Just, uh, thinking about that issue, I landed in, in, in Oxford and didn't know where I was going. And I looked at this gentleman and I said, do you know where Balil is? And he, I remember him looking down at me and saying, ah, oh, they're letting women in, right? And uh, <laughs> And that was my first Oxford conversation. <laughs> and I suspect it's not as, um, as blatant as that now. Um, it, it wasn't how it, um, the, the rest of my time progressed, but it was a little, little inkling of what, what was happening in the background as, mm-hmm. um, as the system was changing. I think where what has shifted as well is um, I'm sure the, the young folks are just as diffident uh, internally, but I think there is a sense of... Um, understanding the world and it, I'm sure part of it is the social uh, media, the access to information. But I came in here feeling so much more diffident. I walked in through the through uh, along the um, garden and I was reflecting on the first day I walked in through the gate uh, coming into the garden and I just I just didn't feel like I was part of my body. It was mm-hmm. this unearthly feeling, and I don't have that anymore. And I think part of it because I didn't know where I was in the world, in my place in the world, and uh, 
the, the younger folks now, I think, come in knowing a little more about where they're going, perhaps, mm -hmm. at least in my interactions. Um, and I suspect some of it is uh, the culture that a Rhodes House is built in that time to be more welcoming and, and engaging that conversation. Um, we didn't engage in that conversation. You were here. It was an honor. And you had, a, you had to go off and, you know, make it worth everyone's while. <laughs> Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I think for me also, it's partially the world is different now. I felt like a real Midwestern hick, honestly, when I came here, Midwestern U.S. And, you know, to meet people from all over the world, Oxford was so much more of an international place than I was used to. And, you know, the media here was international media, even the the local par papers carried much more international news mm -hmm. than I was used to in the States, and it was really incredibly eye-opening for me. We didn't have, you know, we had television, but we didn't have social media the way there is now. So I think international u news was much less common, and the U.S. is very parochial, and now I think it's harder for U.S. college students to be quite as parochial as we were then. So so for me, it was really uh, a great experience in opening my eyes to the world. For most of us, our Oxford journeys started in earnest at the Rhodes interview, when we got selected. And what was definitely a moment of excitement and joy also became almost instantly a moment of reflection and maybe even a little panic. I remember the shock of that moment, going up to my hotel room and calling my parents to tell them that I had been selected for the scholarship. They freaked out a little, in a good way, and after I hung up, the elation kind of subsided and I was just sitting there alone with this big folder of Oxford information that I had been handed. And that was when the fear set in. I wasn't even out of undergrad, and until the interview, I had never met a Rhodes Scholar before. I had no idea what this was going to mean or how I was going to live up to it. And I was lucky in a lot of ways. When I came up to Oxford, my Rhodes class from the United States included 16 women scholars, 50% of our incoming class. I looked around that year, and I didn't really have to think about gender and representation. It just looked about right. And then we were told that we were actually the first year that that had happened, the first time the U.S. had elected as many women as men, 2010. So maybe this was becoming the new normal, but it was still startlingly new. And there were other ways to feel alone or out of place. As time goes on, we find ourselves talking more and more about representation that goes beyond just gender. A lot of the speakers at the anniversary talked about these feelings, our sense of achievement, doing battle with our insecurities. Uh, so this is me talking to Maria Sachiko Cecire, uh, Virginia and Keeble 2006, and Naran Khan, Michigan and St. Anthony's 2006. Okay, Maria, what did it feel like when you first got the roads? You both talked about this a bit on your panels. Did you realize what a big impact this would have on your life? I think because I didn't expect it, I thought the whole process would be a good experience. Um, once it dawned on me, as you say, that my whole life was going to change, it's terrifying um, and you know exciting, a wonderful opportunity, but also comes with an immense responsibility if you take the roads seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, the roads. Trust says that what we are here for is to stand up for the world, fight the world's fight, um, you know, try to make the world a better place. And, you know, naive and wide-eyed as I was and continue to be, that still is something that I feel really tasked with doing. And to go from wanting to just lead a good life that, you know, does no harm and maybe does a bit of good to suddenly being told that you have the resources and therefore should make a big difference in the world, I mean, it's so overwhelming and you know, frightening. Yeah. So I was elated, of course, excited, totally felt like an imposter. Mm -hmm. um, and also, yeah, just uh, kind of suddenly having to do some scrambling in my mind for like, what could my life be? And I think I'm still scrambling. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are. Yeah. 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 Naran, what was getting the roads like for you? Um, I think I was just, I just, thought it was preposterous. Like I, it was even during the interview process, even as things got realer in terms of preparing for it, like I was just happy to be invited to the party. Like I was, <laughs> I, I 
and I, so I wasn't even sad about it. Like it, it felt so special to me to be a part of the process to um, have the kind of introspection and like the opportunity to think about like to envision my life. Like I, I love the process. I was really excited by it. I love, you know, talking about my interests and I, I'm really interested in other people. And so the fact that the interview process involved other people, like I was just excited to hear about them. And so when it happened, I literally couldn't believe it. And, and, um, I was obviously happy and overjoyed, but I did also feel this tremendous sense of responsibility for the rest of my life. One, just representationally, being a Muslim woman of color, a uh, daughter of immigrants, like, you know, like, you better do this right. And um, and so I, I, I felt part of that. And then I also just felt like it just ups the expectations for where your life will take you. And when when all the little incremental steps it, it, that, that, that follow feel small, you, you know, there's a dissonance between the greatness that everyone expects of you and, and like, you know, like taking the LSAT afterwards or, you know, doing your exams. And so, and then I'll just say like, you know, once you get here, if you're not happy all the time, you also feel this tremendous sense of, um, like, why can't I be happy? Like why this is the greatest thing that could ever happen to you. Like you are undeserving because you can't be happy here. And so, so yeah, I'm sure I know many other people feel this way. I, so many other scholars in my life, whether or not I knew it was happening then, you know, it's, it's subsequently come to light that they were experiencing these things. And so, um, you know, it all works out. Okay. <laughs> You know, mostly, but but I I definitely struggled with a lot of those feelings. Um, I, w- I was so unbelievably happy. The anniversary at the outset may have seemed like it was about how women are changing the Rhodes Scholarship. I think that's definitely how I thought about it. But the scholarship also changes us. This thing we didn't think we were qualified for, that we're not even sure we fit into or live up to, it has a huge impact on us, our opportunities, our perspectives. Here's Jen Robinson. My name is Jen Robinson. I am Australia at Large in Balliol 2006, and I'm currently a barrister at Dowdy Street Chambers in London, which is Europe's and potentially internationally one of the biggest human rights legal practices. What did getting the roads mean to you? When I was growing up in Australia, I didn't know a lawyer, let alone a Rhodes Scholar. Um, I grew up in an area where the numbers of people that went to university were very low, but unemployment was very high and I was teased for using big words. Um, you know, the idea, I was lucky I had supportive parents um, and I worked three jobs to get myself to university um, and with government benefits and support. So when someone suggested that I apply for the Rhodes Scholarship, I, to be honest, I didn't really know what it was and certainly didn't think that I'd ever get one. Um, and I think it's changed it really changed the course of my life. So when I was a university student in Australia, I read about um, famous human rights lawyers like Jeffrey Robertson QC and Michael Ratner in the US context, all older white men. Um, And I admired them and I wanted to emulate their careers. And within a few years, I was working alongside them on some of the world's biggest human rights cases. My work's been on the front page of the New York Times. Um, Before I was 30, I was working, I advised on the largest leak in in, of classified information in history and worked on two of the most famous political um, asylum cases uh, in the world ever. Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, and Benny Wender, the, the leader of the liberation movement of West Papua. And so, you know, that came with accolades and it came with death threats and even a lawyer's rights watch complaint, thanks to Hillary Clinton's State Department. But to be working as a lawyer on the international stage like that, I get contacted by young women all the time saying, how, do you, how did you get to where you are yeah. and how can I do that? Yeah. And I really want to be able to say to them, you, if you work really hard, you can do this too. But the reality is, is that it was the Rhodes Scholarship and being at Oxford and the privileged access that I then had to education and to networks and to mentors meant that it really gave me my start in this work on a global stage. Jeffrey Robertson QC is a former Rhodes Scholar, Australian barrister and judge in the international courts. Um, Through that platform and the work working with him, I met Michael Ratner, who became a dear mentor to me. Unfortunately, he passed away last year. But I've ended up working with some of the world's most famous lawyers. And really, I think that's because, as Nairi said, Nairi Woods just said in our panel, 
getting the Rhodes Scholarship absolutely and fundamentally changed the way that we would be able to have an impact on the world. And so I don't take that for granted in any way, shape or form. And it really informs the way that I think about privilege and how committed I am to using the privilege that I now have as somebody who never considered themselves as privileged because I had to work so hard. I don't come from wealth. I had to work really hard to get here, but I am privileged because of this opportunity. Mm-hmm. And how do we use that to improve things and give other people opportunities? I mentioned at the start of this chapter that how did we get here is as much a personal question as it is an institutional or societal one. And those different scales often interact. As much as the scholarship challenges us, there are ways that our self-questioning will challenge the scholarship. Here's Julie Taylor, Zimbabwe and St. Anthony's 2003, talking about that. What's interesting for me, just thinking, looking at this weekend and reflecting on everything that's passed, um, it's an ongoing relationship, it's an ongoing um, set of developments. And I think now yeah, I do feel more grown up and a, a bit more, I, ha- I have different perspectives on things. I also have different perspectives on things because I live in South Africa and because there are very intense discussions um, underway in South Africa the last two years about the colonial and apartheid legacy, Mm -hmm. about the legacy of roads, about representations of um, key colonial figures. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of discussions about the decolonization of knowledge in the university space. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I think about these things almost every day because I'm in an environment where it's top of mind for a lot of people. Um, And, yeah, so obviously forced to or motivated to think about my personal relationship to Rhodes's legacy, to the scholarship, to um, what I've, what I've, how I've benefited and how I can, you know, put my skills to, to use. Um, So, yeah, I I think about it frequently. How did we get here? It's a question with a lot of different dimensions. And here's another one. Why did we come to the anniversary? Why did we want to be there? What made us sign up and show up? It's interesting. When a lot of us arrived in Oxford, so many of us felt like we didn't belong in some way. But when we came back, we were looking for reconnection for belonging that we knew we could find here. Uh, so my name is Annie Croutier Labadzi. Um, I'm Quebec in Wadham, 2008. So I came, I came for a couple of reasons. I came to catch up with really good friends and make it a bit of a reunion. Um, I think living, living in the city I live in is, can get a little lonely sometimes. And so I went here for community. The second is that I know anytime I go to a Rhodes event, um, my brain cells are going to be stirred. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm going to be, I, I spent the last three nights, maybe it's jet lag, but maybe it's the, all the conversations, just not sleeping and thinking through a bunch of things. So I came to be disrupted and I definitely got that. And then it's just so inspiring uh, to see all of these women who came before us having really honest and vulnerable storytelling about their lives, um, that that really energized me. This was a common theme, community as the antidote to professional or personal isolation, which we can feel at various stages of our lives, and networking, not necessarily as a strategy for self-promotion or personal advancement, but as a way of re-energizing or recharging. A lot of us, generations apart, also came seeking a little advice and wisdom. Chapter 2, Call the Helpline. I'm Mutawa Shemtembwa, Zimbabwe, Teddy Hall, uh, 2010. Can you say what you just said right after the talk? How did it make you feel? What did you want to do? Yeah, um, oh yeah, that's the big thing. So I just want to just come, come together and have a big group hug and just get that kind of physical connection <laughs> because they um, spoke to, on so many different things that... Um, you know, you, you just want to come, you know, just have that physical feeling at the end. You know. Yeah. Did you guys feel that way too? I do want to run up there and give them a big hug. I think they they really bore their, their feelings and their souls and their own journeys. Um, 
I didn't actually expect them to talk about their careers when they were 30s and how it was actually very difficult for them um, in that point in time in their careers and how the, that message again to the need to let go and recognize you can't be the master of everything and there are a lot of hard times. Um, so you see their biographies initially and you just think, wow, okay, they're going to talk about where they're at and their amazing positions and perhaps their time in Oxford. But actually that in time in between was very formative for them. So that was a couple of my fellow 2010 scholars. You heard Mutza introduce herself at the beginning, and the second voice on the recording was Elliot, Kansas, and Hartford 2010. We had just attended a panel on international cooperation and security. And you know, this kind of reaction, it happened a lot. Simply sharing experiences, much like the ones we heard in chapter one, had a big impact on us. And among other things, it made us think about what we wished we had known before coming to Oxford and what we still need to know now. It made us long for a helpline, a way to call across the generations for insight, advice, wisdom, and resources to just help us navigate through the scholarship and our lives. It was helpful and even sort of entertaining to hear how different Oxford was for some of the early women scholars. I heard how difficult it was to access High Table at Maudlin in high heels. Well, that's actually kind of still true. You have to walk on the roof, and if it's been raining, trust me, you do take your life in your hands. I also heard about how porters kept a close watch on the whereabouts of female scholars, often scolding them for taking long weekends away or staying out late. Here's Jennifer Haverkamp. The anecdote I always look back and laugh at, and we even laughed at the time, was that these were also the times when the mores were changing, and it was much more accepted that young men would be spending the night in your rooms. And Somerville was going to take a deep breath and say, okay. But on the other hand, the college was very worried about fire safety. Oh, right. <laughs> and what if there was a fire? What if? What if? How would you know who'd been in those rooms? How would you identify the charred bodies? Or I don't know what. But they came up with this scheme. There was a box in the porter's lodge. And whenever you're going to have an overnight guest, you are supposed to put that person's name on a piece of paper in that box. And they swore the next morning that they destroyed them all without reading them. <laughs> so obviously Oxford has changed a great deal in just 40 years. And Rhodes House has also changed. That really came out even between the last anniversary, which happened 10 years ago, the 30th anniversary, and this one. Here are Maria Sassiri and Nuran Khan. A couple of things come to mind. First of all, we had to have a bit of a pitched battle to get the first 30 years um, Rhodes Women event. Um, myself um, and a couple other people um, went to the warden saying we want to do this. And he said to us, the, the warden at the time said, well, we don't see ourselves as women scholars and men scholars and black <laughs> yeah. scholars. We're all Rhodes scholars. I don't see why we should have some separate events. Uh -huh. to, you know, we're like, no, well, thank you for that opinion but you know so it was a real pushback and so it actually took some um a little bit of convincing in order for Rhodes House to do this and now obviously Rhodes House is itself like totally hosting this and put on this wonderful 40th um event that we are currently here for so um that has really changed um one thing that's been interesting obviously is thinking about the um leadership seminars and um retreats that you all have now um I feel like that's very different I I think it would have been an amazing thing to have had. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very lucky to have a very close relationship with my college um, and still to this day have a very close relationship with my British friends from my college. And um, I hope that current scholars still are able to connect with our colleges in that way. But I can imagine that, you know, it's better to have more choices than not. And having mm -hmm. these retreats and things, I think, is a great way to build community here at Rhodes House. In some ways, it almost feels like Rhodes House is becoming a college. Um, and so how that changes the Rhodes experience is something I'm just interested to learn about. And talking with current scholars, just seeing how some of them have been better able to connect with Oxford or not maybe um, is something that I find interesting. I, I will say, I think I had occasion just through conversation over two years to have really deep um, conversations with my Rhodes classmates as well as, you know, a lot of other students here. And to have a formalized structure for that, I, I think is great, especially if it's like stewarded with alums and people who have had mm. great life experience. A lot of times, if you're in conversation, like two young people are in conversation, like existential crisis, thinking about like moral and ethical and directional things, 
it would be super nice to have someone in the room who was able to assure you or maybe had the language or tools to provide support. So so I, I, I'm um, super, super jealous of, of that opportunity. I, I would have loved it. And, and, you know, we made, we bootstrapped and made our own of whether it was certain communities, um, you know, the Muslim Road Scholars were, we celebrated holidays together. We experienced things together. We continue to stay in touch. There's, there's communities we made up, but to have that formalized and appropriately supported, I think is um, a real, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely, lovely thing. I would agree with that. At the 40th anniversary, there were a lot of opportunities to have intergenerational conversations, to call the helpline, so to speak. They happened between panel sessions, at lunches and dinners, and walking home at the end of the day. There were also designated mentoring sessions aimed at creating a space for this kind of encounter. I asked Jessica Teich, Connecticut and Maudlin 1981, what she found herself telling younger scholars in those mentoring sessions. In every um, encounter, I found myself saying a different version of the same thing, which was, don't be afraid. Like, take a chance. You'll figure it out. You're bigger than anything that can happen to you. And in each instance, I was saying, okay, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? And we would literally talk about, like, what's the very worst thing that can happen to you? Okay, if that happens, then what? And I just think we're all so afraid as if there's anything that could happen to us that we wouldn't be able to deal with and probably in some ways already have. And in each of the four instances of these conversations today, there was someone who's so accomplished, so dynamic, so radiant with promise, who's just waiting for someone to give her permission to do the things that she knows she's meant to do. And that's what I find frustrating, because I feel like as one of the sort of earlier, older women road scholars, I spent a lot of time waiting for someone almost literally, to invite me into these rooms. I'd never seen any of these rooms in Rhodes House. And the idea that people are sitting in these rooms with their feet up on the couches, I mean, that is absolutely not who we allowed ourselves to be. I should point out that a helpline doesn't just operate in one direction. The older generations inspiring the young, the younger scholars seeking guidance from the older ones. It's more of an exchange. I'm Nancy Ann DeParl. When I was a Rhodes Scholar, my name was Nancy Ann Min, and I'm Tennessee and Balliol, 1979. So Nancy, as one of the early scholars, do you feel like there's a learning process going on here in sharing stories from different generations of scholars? You know, I've wondered that over the weekend. I, I, um, I guess I think it is. I think uh, I studied history, not at Oxford. I studied politics and economics, but I studied history as an undergrad. And yes, I do think we learn something from it. We gain perspective. Um, I heard one woman uh, stand up the other day and say, you know, voice concern about the fact that when she was interviewed for the Rhodes Scholarship, there were only two women on her committee mm -hmm. and of maybe seven or eight. And yes, but there's a group of us that when we went through, there were no women. And one perspective that I have is the extraordinary efforts that the Rhodes um, Trust and, the, and the, the warden and the various secretaries around the world went to, at least in the U.S. I guess I can't speak for, for the other um, countries, but in the U.S., the American secretary went to extraordinary lengths to make sure there were women on the committees as soon as there were women who finished at Oxford. So I do think those perspectives are interesting and hopefully informative. And, and likewise, um, all of us uh, who are more senior Rhodes Scholar women are still um, in many ways finding our way or hoping to be raising children who are uh, more aware of, of um, these obstacles. And so it's great to hear the perspectives of the younger women Rhodes Scholars. There was a sense in these conversations that we were building something, that we were wiring the connection, that telephonic intergenerational exchange. But that network, what would it look like after the weekend was over? Here's what Karen Stevenson said about that in her opening remarks. How 
are we going to reach back and support the scholars that are here now? The guys have had the old boys network. They have called on their friendships, um, their cross-references for jobs, their uh, golfing pals, belong to clubs. There's been you know, the old boys network. Well, I don't want to have an old girls network. I just want to have a community. A community instead of an old boys club, or even an old girls club for that matter. Some scholars already had an idea of what that could look like. Here's Jen Robinson. One of the most remarkable things about my time in Oxford is a group of friends that came together here. Uh, Catherine Wilkinson from the US, Alex Conliffe from Canada, and Jenny Whalen down in Australia. The four of us get together, we're friends here, and get together every year, and have done ever since Oxford. And we spend the weekend really looking after each other and workshopping with each other, our personal lives, our professional lives, how we're living our lives, whether we're happy, whether we're making the choices that are right for us, and reminding each other of um, who we are and what we're capable of. And I come away from those weekends feeling so inspired and enthusiastic and renewed, and it gives me a new sense of motivation and purpose and direction and excitement about what I'm doing. And I, and I think that that's something that this community can do for each other. That sounds like a pretty good start. Not the good old boys club, but something more like this. Chapter three, the road less traveled. For me and many others, I'm sure the anniversary weekend was a unique chance to stand in a room with some of the first women to walk this path. They blazed the trail for us and we devoured their stories. We craved their advice. Because the reality is that this is the road less traveled, and we're still on it. So where do we go from here? Where do our own individual winding country lanes to personal fulfillment meet the massive multi-lane highway to gender equality? And how on earth do we stand up for the world as the Rhodes Scholarship now calls us to do? That call to fight the world's fight or stand up for the world often makes it seem like we really better know exactly where we're going. It's true, but it's even more difficult for people who have diverse interests. This is Naran Khan and Maria Ciceri again. Mm-hmm. That, you know, later on at the end of your life, you could tell a full story of what you're hoping to achieve. But I think the um, just the jack of all trades, master of none thing really resonates for me because I'm like, um, and also because, you know, I'm like a lawyer. I practiced law for a couple of years. It's not what I do now. I'm a this, I'm a that. I think... Um, in the end, it will all work out, but it is actually very hard to capture other than uh, an underlying value system that drives it. Mm-hmm. It's actually very hard to capture those things. And I think uh, we, at, in in both the world in which we live that um, disparages expertise, there's also a world that fetishizes it and shoehorns young people especially into careers and ways of thinking in depth that make them less... Um, less able to respond to the needs of a world that demands more of us. A little meta-analysis here, right? The idea of, first of all, the idea that I stand up for X suggests that you have to have an answer to X, right? And, And that suggests a way of thinking which assumes that you're going to really have one career trajectory, maybe one career, um, and that your interests and skill sets are really focused just in one area. Um, and, you know, for some people, they're able to really pull it together and do that, uh, which is great. But for many of us, and I think increasingly for our generation, that's not really the way things look. It's harder to articulate um, and so harder to brand. And um, so that's never good for yeah. certain outcomes. Uh, But I think it's true that asking people to be able to define themselves in that narrow way um, necessarily, even if you don't mean to, restricts being able to capture a whole person and their capabilities. And the other thing is, while I'm continuing the meta-analysis, I'm sure someone else has brought this up, but, you know, the the idea of standing up for uses ableist language, which, you know, you got to be able to talk. So sometimes we just have to pick words, but embedded in our language are expectations about um, who or Uh, what kinds of communities are able to make major change in the world. Mm. So, um, you know, I I think that I love that that question is being asked. What is it that you're here for? What is it that you're trying to do in the world? But I also think that it's a a complicated answer. And sometimes even in the asking, we have to um, turn the lens back on ourselves and say, so why am I asking this question? So standing up for the world, 
This one phrase maybe doesn't capture the ways in which we change. Our paths change, our ideas and interests change, and the ways in which we stand up, literally or figuratively, will vary within the community and across time. And that's okay. But here's the important takeaway. I heard it over and over again. Embrace that. Here's Denise Thal. So you get to, your degree is done, what are you going to do next when you go back to your home country or not? And I remember distinctly the feeling of, oh, I've got to have it all figured out. Like, what am I going to do, not just next, but what's it going to lead to and what's the next thing? Because I have to make sure that I do X, Y, and Z by a certain age. And Mm -hmm. at that point, I wasn't thinking that I would have a family even. I was just trying to figure out how I was going to make the world a better place. Not because there was pressure, but because I actually wanted to do that. That concern still feels very live with Mm -hmm the scholars now, the young scholars. Mm -hmm. And I hope if we've accomplished anything this weekend, we've made them realize that you can't know. You've just got to take the next thing that seems like the right thing, and it will lead to the next thing, and Mm -hmm. will lead to the next thing. And and straight lines aren't necessarily better than hills and valleys. And to trust yourself and also take time for yourself— so that you make thoughtful choices. And we need to make a little space for ourselves too. If we're too busy trying to straighten our paths, trying to fit in, trying to stand up for the world in one particular way, we forget that what unites us, what we share is actually our diversity of experience. Many of us may have started this journey as outsiders or at least feeling that way, but at various points in our lives, we'll wind up on the inside, Just being part of the Rhodes community brings us inside in a lot of ways. We occupy a privileged space here. Ramona Doyle from the class of 1981 reminded us in the closing plenary session that this is where change happens, in moving between the outside and the inside throughout our lives. Insiders can hold the door open for outsiders. Outsiders can disrupt the status quo. I happened to sit down next to Ian MacDonald, a 1952 scholar, during the opening session. He was a male scholar in Oxford long before there were female scholars in the community. And he was an early advocate of opening the scholarship up to women, he said. So you were here long before there were female scholars? 25 years before. (laughs) What do you think about an event like this? Well, you know, some of us hoped to see this day, and it's hard to imagine that those hopes were more than 40 years ago now and uh, all that's transpired. And you were saying that uh, you were actually advocating for there to be women scholars early on. Well, this morning in the discussion, there was a certain references to the old boys club. And I was saying that uh, some of us never felt we belonged to the old boys club and we were outsiders too. That experience of being outsiders to a lot of male conventions of the day that dominated society, I think, made us a lot more sensitive to uh, the very much larger issues that women were facing, and we wanted to work at that, and we did. (laughs) An outsider on the inside. That's another answer to that big anniversary question. How did we get here? For most of us at the anniversary weekend, we were there because we're women and we're Rhodes Scholars. But we're not only those things. Those labels, just like any others, don't completely define us. I asked Jessica Teich, a writer, about the words we use and the categories we put ourselves in. We label ourselves a lot in order to find common ground. But what actually unites us as women? You know, I, I think one of the things I've learned is, is, is not to generalize in a way, and I don't, I don't mean that um, in, in at all a deflating sense, but I think maybe that's one of the problems with panels like the ones that we all served on is there, there becomes this kind of not very pliable definition of what female empowerment is, for example, on, on our panel. And, and I think I'm very loath to participate in these sort of monolithic um, Definitions, and I think that's one of the things that I always struggled with about the roads. I never felt that I belonged to that definition. I was a, a loner. I was liberal. I was Jewish. Am Jewish. I was a dancer. I was a writer. In '81, when I was chosen, nobody was any of those things, let alone all of them. And that sense of otherness really haunted me when I was here. And um, I, I think one of the things that 
I fear women do. I wouldn't say all women, but I do think we're, you know, so busy watching ourselves to make sure that we're doing whatever it is that we think is expected of us by everyone around us. And and so that freedom to kind of be in the moment, but that, that freedom just to be, not to posture, not to perform, not to transmute, not to prove anything to anyone, but just to to be, because the truth is, I think, I've learned at this very advanced age that the things that people love us for are never the things that we could strive to be. Those are always the things that people notice or care about that you wouldn't have known to try to prove. And I just think there needs to be so much more freedom to just be those things in perfect. And I think that's true of falling in love too. You, I, from my experience is that you, you find things you didn't even know to ask for in some way because the lists so-called that we all have have nothing to do with happiness. And, and luckily enough, if you're lucky enough, life helps you learn that in time to find that with someone else. Like each and every one of us, the 40th anniversary of Rhodes Women was inspired and imperfect. We have to work hard to challenge the homogenizing and flattening effects of a category like women. And at the same time, we have to find some solidarity in it in order to collectively press for change. The anniversary offered a venue for building a shared community around individual experiences. And I have a feeling that even after 40 years, this is only the beginning. The Rhodes House podcast is brought to you by the Rhodes Trust. It's produced by me, Kira Allman, and original music for this series is by Connor Malloy. You can stream these podcasts on the Rhodes Trust website.